Mom and Dad, we thought we'd take a special trip down memory lane with you, recalling some old stories, some events that you've been through. So Walt and Shirley, Mom and Dad, just let the years unwind and join us on this journey while we travel back through time. A boy named Walter Gray was born. His parents' pride ran deep. Virginia followed later, and their family was complete. When Walt was barely two years old, a brown-eyed girl was born to Steve and Georgia Cohut on one spring-like April morn. This precious child was beautiful, and Shirley was her name. When she was almost five years old, her brother Baylor came. Their childhood days were different. Walt's parents grew apart. They divorced, and yet they still found love in Walter's heart. On Sundays, Walter's dad arrived for dinner every week to visit with both Walt and Jen. Their time was short but sweet. Sometimes they'd all go to the show, and Walt would always win. They'd see a western cowboy flick, a shoot 'em up right, Jen? Both Walt and Shirley's mothers worked outside the home for pay and this was quite unusual for women in their day. So Shirley's early years were spent right by her grandma's side. Together they'd plant flowers and they'd watch them grow with pride. When Shirley was barely five years old and Christmas time was nearing, she prayed and prayed for toy dishes, but Santa was not hearing. On Christmas morn she sprang from bed but couldn't find those dishes. She cried for almost five days straight that Santa Claus was vicious. But on that fifth day she awoke and found her plates and saucers. She opened up a trunk and saw the dishes Santa brought her. And through the years she grew to be a beauty packed with charm. She twirled baton, she played softball, all with a wicked arm. She even shot the hoops a bit when she attended school and when she donned her bathing suit, the boys would start to drool. Her senior class elected her the prettiest girl that year, and seeing her before us now, the reason's crystal clear. Walt graduated from high school in 1949. He bid adieu to St. Mary's, determined in his mind to join the nation's proud but few, becoming a Marine so handsome in his uniform, so tall, so proud, so lean. His hard-nosed sergeant told him that he had the virtues of an officer who could lead men Walt was a cut above. He said Walt was superior in mind and in physique. He had the attributes that made Walt one of the elite. He recommended Walt apply for West Point if he could. His clean-cut dashing looks would make his chances very good. So Walt applied with lots of help from friends and family, and later was accepted to West Point Academy. Walt grew to be a dashing sort, a John Wayne type of guy. While studying at West Point, he published Malachi. His poem, The Man of Malachi, was Walter's very best. His perfect rhyme and meter would pass every critic's test. Walt did excel at West Point, but mathematics was a bear. With head held high, he ventured on while leaving memories there. Then, finally, Walt and Shirley's paths did cross, but with a twist. Their mutual friend named Mary Ann tried so hard to resist the pleas from Shirley every day to introduce Walt to her, but Mary Ann protested and recited Walt's faults to her. Eventually, Mary Ann gave in. They dated for a spell. While at a party, Shirley learned what Walt had bragged here tell, how he was going to dump Cheryl when he took her home that night. She beat Walt to the punch, and then he begged with all his might for Shirley not to break it off. He loved her, it was true. And then, on April 25th, they both exchanged I do's. The year was 1953, when they joined hands together, promising to cherish and to love for now, forever. The years passed by so quickly, and their children multiplied. First came Linda, then Karen, then Glennon joined the tribe. Then eight years later, Steve arrived. Their family had been formed. Linda was 14 years old when Steve and Gray was born. 
While growing up, we kids played ball with help from mom and dad. Mom would catch while dad would pitch with all the strength he had. And when we didn't have a game, we'd be at Forest Park, watching dad while he played ball for hours after dark. Highlight of our evening came if dad's team won the game. We'd all go to the tavern and the other children came. The Gould girls and the Brinker boys and Michael Katie too. The Langs, the Gleets, the Callings, join the Sharps to name a few. We'd play outside and drink our Cokes and sing songs way off key. Inside they would relive each play, but this time verbally. It always seemed the verbal game was better than the first. Exaggeration freely flowed while they all drank and cursed. All except for Walter Sharp, whose expletives were mild. Dad Gummit was a favorite that was fit for every child. Sometimes a stick it in your ear was fiercely bellowed out, and more times than I'd care to note, you're gone, the ump would shout, and Shirley came to watch the games with suntan deep and dark. She would stay while Walt would be ejected from the park. And later she would calm him down, like only Cheryl can do. She should be called St. Shirley, Dad, for putting up with you. When you couldn't play as well, you put a team together. The names have changed, the faces too, through years at this endeavor. Leo Morrow, Shadow, Simmons, Tipton, Eddie Hewells, Barda Kopak, Lyons, Taylor, Lay, to name a few. The Kudis team would change with time, some names forever etched, in hotels back in Louisville where more than one guy retched. Those tournaments were pretty wild, at least that's what we hear. On one such trip, a superhero suddenly appeared. Yes, Captain Marvel was his name with super suit disguise. He could fly and disappear before your very eyes. Someone who'll remain nameless lost his choppers too, hidden by his roommate, but you'll have to guess just who. We hear Mike Regan tagged along and was initiated. With help from Tim and Denny, he became inebriated. The cutest trips and stories could incessantly be told, like stealing Vincent's uniform right off his back. How bold! The Kudis team is different now. They're men with families. The Gleets, the Regans, and the Sharps, Dave Seals, and both the Heats. There's Tom O'Neill and Dan Deckard, and there's Andrietta, too. Satch Schwarzenbach, Vince, Johnny G, and Kent, to name a few. Shirley packs a cooler for the Kudis team each week. They drink a brew or have a Coke, and then they all retreat. But Shirley occupies her time with other chores as well. Coordinating Walter's clothes is pure and utter hell. When Cheryl was so fed up with all the daily household grind, she went out in the working world determined now to find a job to get her out so she could keep her sanity, and she was hired by Sidney Smith's, the local pharmacy. She worked and slaved for 15 years in Kirkwood, close to home, so she could have some extra cash that she could call her own. She still had all the other chores that she would always do, like paint the house and cut the grass and handle bills, it's true. She cooked, she cleaned and carpooled, and she managed that and more. She had to tolerate the way that Walt would always snore. Of course, it's only natural that Shirley have some fun. Her yearly outings with the girls, they gossip, eat, and sun. They gather all together in Geneva's trusty van, Shirley, Betty, Jerry, Jean, Jen Stell, Pat, Mary Ann. This group of friends does travel light with bare necessities like donuts, soda, beer and wine, assorted fruits and cheese. They dash off to the races if the group is so inclined or spend relaxing weekends at the Brinkers drinking wine. And they chat about their children and then brag about grandkids. They bare their souls, then take a dip. Yes, this is how it is. These friends are very dear to Cheryl. She loves each one of them. She loves those getaways so much and hates it when they end. While speaking of Cheryl's varied trips, sometimes she does escape off to the lights of Las Vegas where she can get away. She and Karen venture off on mother-daughter trips. They play the slots, they see the shows while living on the strip. 
Here was 1979 when Karen took her there and introduced her to the sights, the shows, and the cab fare. She introduced Cheryl to a sight that she had never seen. Male strippers danced around her like she was their wicked queen. She blushed and blushed, but you must note she never, ever blinked. They tried to get Cheryl up on stage while she gulped down her drink. She would not take a picture with the stripper known as Paul, and later when they left the place, she tried real hard to stall. So later on the cab ride back, she told her daughter Karen she really wished she'd had the guts to be a bit more daring. She wished she'd had a picture then to show Walt of the stripper. They stopped the cab and took one with the cabbie and his zipper. Had a blast, saw Wayne Newton, and several other shows, it's become a great tradition that they treasure and behold. There are so many different memories that make us laugh aloud, like Walter playing hockey, a great goalie who was proud. Actually, Walt was very good, although he could not skate, but he would guard the goal just like a catcher guards the plate. Both Glenn and Steve followed Walt's lead. Yes, they were goalies, too. Armed with all their goalie gear, they'd stop each puck for you. Walt even piqued the interest of some future hockey greats. Brandon O'Neill and Matthew Heat invested in some skates. Young Brandon was a goalie, too, whose legend still lives on. Kirkwood's high school trophy bears his name now that he's gone. Little Walt and Danny both are playing hockey now. Just look what you have started, Dad. The family's all involved. There's many other stories that we'd like to share with you, but it would take us hours, so we've mentioned just a few. These 40 years have flown right by. Your children now are grown. Both Linda Lee and Karen have some children of their own. Linda married Satch, and they've been married 18 years. At first, Walt didn't quite approve, but time has calmed his fears. Now he loves Satch like a son. They bum around car shows. Satch is his mechanic, and Walt's fondness for Satch grows. They've given Walt and Cheryl grandkids. There's Angela Michelle, who's talented and beautiful and very smart as well. There's little Walt, who's six years old and now attending school. A pawpaw's boy down to his toes. He's handsome and so cool. And then there is sweet Lindsay Lee, who's barely one year old. She's lovable and huggable, the youngest of the fold. And Karen married Vincent, who cooks almost every meal. A member of the Kudis team in sales, he wheels and deals. And Karen has the daughter that she wished for for so long. Stephanie, with big blue eyes, who never thinks she's wrong. She takes ballet and swimming, and she loves the weekends when her sister and her brother come to visit now and then. Her sister is named Erin, who will soon attend high school, and Danny is a hockey nut who likes to bend the rules. And Glenn's the Civil War buff who is living on his own. He's working for the railroad and has just bought his own home. He has that inner urge to start his own business. To be an entrepreneur is his deepest, darkest wish. He's also into videos, creating works of art, and this one bears his handiwork sincerely from his heart. Along with all your children and the grandkids here today, your brother and your sister join us here to celebrate. Baylor is Cheryl's brother, who is quite the chef, it's true. He works down at the brewery where he sampled one or two. And Marianne is Baylor's wife, who's reigning red-hot queen. She oversees a daycare where she watches the Camines. Virginia is Walt's sister, who was flown in yesterday. She loves to travel and have fun and likes to get her way. With us tonight are all your friends, the Gleets, the Langs, Walt Fink, the Brinkers and the Guthries too, the Cadies, the Kameens. There's Marilyn Rich and Jeannie Gall and the Markowskis too, and Carboline is interspersed throughout this group for you. First there are the girls from work, from Dear Old Ribbon Rhymes, and then there is the Kudis team, your many friends entwined. Your special friends from the reserves at Kirkwood's old PD, the Shofferts, the McChesneys here for everyone to see. 
the Kaplans and your family, the Kells and Aunt Mary, the Sauters and the Kohuts, the Vajans and Aunt Jenny, your children and your family and your friends all tip their glass and toast the 40 years that we've relived that now have passed. Along with all these treasured friends, there's others we all miss. We'd like to take this time right now to fondly reminisce. To mention all those we have lost who physically are gone, who we hold in our memories and in our hearts live on. There's Grandma and there's Grandpa Kohut, Grandpa Sharp and Pearl, Aunt Lena, Uncle George and Homer who left us from this world. There's Uncle Louis Bollier and Aunt Fleeta, and then we would really like to mention those who left us tragically. There's Bill McCoy and Steve Cady, Dana Markowski too, and then there is Brandon O'Neill. We all still think of you. Let's not forget Sweet Gaga, who is Walter's mom and yet, she suffers from Alzheimer's and she easily forgets. I'm sure they too would lift their glass and toast you if they could to Walt and Shirley Sharp, who both are genuinely good. We thank you for your friendship and your love and thoughtfulness and wish you both good health, good fortune, and much happiness. Everyone should be so blessed to have you both for friends. You're caring and compassionate and quick to make amends. So all of us extend to you, Walt and Shirley Sharp, a happy anniversary, sincerely from our hearts.